Um, so I guess kind of the theme that we've, I guess, is common ground architecture. I can touch on who we are in a second. But, um, we've just finished our first residential building for uh, brick by brick. And I guess rather than just doing a presentation of that building in its kind of entirety from start to finish, which of course is amazingly interesting, um, I thought it would be useful. I thought it would be kind of more interesting story to tell it from the reflection of me having start, gone to start working in Croydon from like over six years ago now um, and working for Croydon Council in the placemaking team um, and to try and chart kind of the evolution from moving from private practice all the way through to kind of finishing our first building as a kind of a, an architecture practice in its own right, which was ever at all what I thought I would be doing when I first kind of arrived at Croydon Council. Um, so by brick and common ground architecture, um, I think a lot of people kind of know who Brick by Brick are now. So it's Croydon Council's development company, um, which was set up to deliver new homes for uh, rent and sale. Um, and a large portion of those go back to the council as affordable rent. Um, and then common ground architecture, which is kind of the team that you can see in the foreground there and see Sarah and Alex who are kind of on the line today as well, um, is common ground architecture which is our in-house design team that's kind of set up. We started working directly for Croydon Council um, and then shortly after Brick by Brick launched, kind of we launched ourselves as a team as well. So Brick by Brick is technically our parent company. Um, we do a lot of our work for Brick by Brick, um, but we have been set up in a way where we can actually, we've commercialized our services so we can go and work with other local authorities and other developers. Um, and so this is kind of a real landmark for us to actually have a building that we finished as common ground architecture to kind of pin our kind of pin our colours to the mark, so to speak, and say, you know, we know how to do it as well. Um, so I can kind of come back to that in a second. This is quite a cluttered timeline, so I apologise for that. But it, it's just to give you an idea about the amount of things that have happened. Um, and this is uh, in the last six years. So. I first started working, I went to work in Croydon at the beginning of 2014. Um, and so six and a half years ago, that was kind of the first move and we're now finishing our first, um, our first building. Um, and there's been a number of moves along the way, which I'll kind of discuss over the next few slides. Um, BC, before Croydon. Um, so I, before I worked for Croydon, I spent about 10 years working for Lifshitz Davidson Sandylands on a whole heap of different projects. And I think this gave me a, kind of a really interesting opportunity to reflect back and go, why did I make the move into the public sector? Um, and I think this project, which is their scheme for boardwall housing uh, for community, uh, Coin Street community builders, was not one that I worked on. I really wish I had worked on it, but it was finished in mid 90s whilst I was still deciding whether or not to do architecture um, but it was probably one of the projects that attracted me to work for them in the first place um, and I think I came out of architecture school very like a lot of architects coming out of architect school um, really did want to work for the public sector and for kind of community groups doing their own housing and so I think that's kind of an interesting arc for me in terms of where I've now ended up um, so I moved to Croydon um, work-wise to join the placemaking team in 2014 um, with Vincent Lacavara and kind of effectively filled um, Finn Williams's old post. Um, and it was kind of a big jump for me at the time um, and kind of was get, going into the unknown a little bit but knew I kind of was venturing into safe hands given that Vinny had kind of created quite a, or cultivated a very interesting urban design team in Croydon. Um, I guess I went there thinking that um, I'd be getting stuck into a whole load of town centre master plans, um, and this is uh, and a whole load of planning policy. But uh, unfortunately for me, that was mostly done by the time I got there. Um, there were still a few bits and pieces going on, but this is kind of one of the, this is a plan of the Croydon opportunity area. Um, with the five town centre master plans that are now kind of yielding quite big results as a um, 
and Croydon's massively changing as a result of them and been very successful. Um, and I guess my role ended up being very much focused on kind of guiding the developments through these um, through these master plans, uh, through negotiating on pre-apps. Um, and I also um, kind of did an awful lot of work and um, Finney was kind of big big advocate of this, of going around the council and selling your services. So I was quite often knocking on the door of the regen team saying, hey, do you want me to do a capacity study? I'm happy to help you with this site. Um, and I think that probably is one of the reasons why I'm in the place where I am now. Um, so it's quite an interesting kind of world in terms of public sector to go around and promote your own skills in your own organisation, which is not something that you necessarily get in a standard architecture practice. Um, and then I guess this is kind of charting moving forward a bit um, in time a little bit is how much politics in local authorities can really either accelerate or drag things out. Um, and in May 2014, Croydon um, had a swing from a conservative administration to a Labour one. Um, and Croydon's quite typical of having that swing. It's a swing seat na um, nationally, and it is also a swing seat locally. Um, and as a result of that, they tend to be quite ambitious with what they want to do in their four year periods. Um, and I think Croy this was no different when the Labour group came in. Um, they are also aligned with the appointment of Jonah Greeney, um, heading up the corporate side of the council, who came in with a very kind of ambitious and, you know, well, we can get things done agenda. Um, and as a result of that, there was a real, um, it was a real kickstart to brick by brick being established in, well, I mean, it was effectively, there was a paper that was approved in 2015, which was establishing the development principle of a development company, um, which with the idea that we would accelerate the development of new homes in the borough. Um, and it was a real kind of trying to figure out how we get things done because Croydon Council doesn't, isn't a huge landowner in its own right. Um, and a lot of the sites that they do own have got, you know, they're quite small and piecemeal and they've been looked at time and time again for their development um, potential for new homes and hadn't ever quite got off, got out of the starting blocks because they were quite, they as smaller sites, they were quite um, expensive to deliver. So it was, the idea was, was set up a development company, turn it into a program, which was kind of bigger than the sum of its parts, so to speak. And kind of, if you're really ambitious and kind of get going, was it was the kind of ethos behind it. It was also very much a, a needs must. Um, I'm sure everybody's kind of aware that there's huge local authority budget cuts. And in 2014 um, in Croydon, it was no different. I think my first meeting I ever sat in for the council was um, them saying that there was going to be a hundred million pound worth of cuts in the next three years. And you're sitting there going, crikey, I've just jacked in my proper architecture job and um, I think I've had to be made redundant because there's no money for anybody. Um, but that's not how quite how things happen. So the local authority also needed to find a source of, in, of income as well, which is one of the main points of Brick by Brick as well, that we buy our sites from the council of a separate independent company. Um, we buy our sites and so there's an income revenue from the, to the council immediately as a result of that. And they also receive the profits of any of our developments after that as well. So there's no money that sits within brick by brick. It all gets recycled back to the council. Um, and so they were, and they're already starting to count our profits as part of their kind of annual turn. Um, so I, I haven't really explained when I joined, but um, so I joined, I kind of jumped ship from the placemaking team to the development team as Brick, as the development company was set up um, to work with Colin Lacey, who's our MD and CEO. Um, and there was a pretty small team of us working on it. I think there was about three or four of us in the first instance. And at the same time, the council decided to go through a restructure of our department. So we had this huge agenda for delivering new homes and a very small number of people. So it was quite hands-on time. Um, and we, um, and it was, we had a, 
yeah, so I kind of joined the team with a mandate to be heading up the design side of these um, schemes, kind of develop a strategy for how we were going to be developing these schemes um, and also design some of them in house as well. Um, so with, I think we had 50 sites on our first list. Um, I think we've probably got 30 or so kind of progressed kind of to a point where they're either completed on site or in the design stages. Um, and it kind of created a strategy for how we could work with a panel of external architects at the same time that we worked um, internally as well. Um, and with 50 sites and only me at that point um, doing that, we kind of couldn't really do that many schemes internally. Uh, we knew we wanted an awful lot of variety. You can kind of see from this map, this is actually all of our live projects at the moment, but there's um, a number of them all over the borough. Um, we didn't want a one size fits all. We wanted to work with lots of different practices to bring variety and character to the schemes that we we're working on. Um, and uh, kind of developed more of a kind of a can do collegiate approach to how we took the schemes forward. And this is just a real handful of some of the projects that we're, we're working on. Um, there's coffee, coffee architect scheme in the top left. Um, we've got a couple of Mikhail Richards ones, um, this is Cold Harbour, a VPPR scheme which we're just um, in some tender negotiations on at the moment. Got a Pittman Taser scheme here, we're in Thornton Heath which is um, now complete um, and we've got the first schemes that were finished which is HTA's Ravensdale project um, which is in kind of the north of the borough and one that's just down the road from it which is Auckland Rise. Um, this is our very own pump house and uh, Avenue Road, which is another scheme that's just um, out for tender at the moment. And then this is a stitch project. Um, so a real, real variety of schemes. Um, and we didn't want to, the whole purpose of how we kind of got going, I guess, was to kind of just work together. And it was a kind of shared kind of thing to drive it forward. We had a number of um, collaborative workshops which was how do we actually focus on delivering these schemes how do we you know get them into planning but at the same time know that we can actually build them so we devised a system of not necessarily retrofitting them all into kind of similar schemes but to work with the parts that nobody sees so we had a pallet of standard bricks um, I think there was about 10 in the end uh, that we can negotiate prices on um, all of them have got the same window systems. They've all got the same kind of internal fit out as well. So in everything that we were doing, we were using the kind of the um, kind of the quantum of the scale of the program that we were delivering to get best value. Um, and I guess kind of Station Road fits into that um, as kind of the first one that we designed. Um, and I guess bringing Sarah and Alex in now, we they joined just as well, Alex probably was the first one to join. Um, and Only just. <laughs> number one. <laughs> and, uh, and kind of worked on Pump House through kind of the early days and into planning. Um, and then Sarah joined kind of probably about three or three weeks later or something um, from McLean. Um, and started working on our little projects on the left of the screen here which is, is kind of archived sadly but um, then joined us to work on Pump House in the detailed design stages and that was our council team name which is design and feasibility team which we were working in the team it was that was our acronym which is brilliant <laughs> and kind of wish we'd called our practice that but yeah so I guess Alex, so let me hand over to you. Do you want to say in a bit about why you joined the team? So it's quite a big risk. Yeah, of course. Yeah, I suppose. Um, I, well, yeah, I joined um, sort of immediately upon graduating my part two. In fact, I'd applied just out of curiosity um, and sort of speculatively not really knowing what the job was about whilst I was still studying. Just um, I suppose because it kind of it tickled my fancy in terms of it being something quite original um, and something I hadn't come across before in terms of public sector architectural practice, I've kind of you know, knew all its history and was sort of quite, um, I guess a lot of my research university was kind of hinged around public sector practice. Um, and so it kind of, yeah, it presented itself as an opportunity. Um, and I ended up starting work sort of immediately upon, upon graduating. Um, but, 
um, it was just kind of a unique opportunity, I suppose, for me um, to be part of something quite integral um, from the very outset. And sort of the, the scope of work seemed to me at least relatively undefined at that point. It was the ambitious, the ambition was there, um, but the ability to have some sort of ownership and you know and being part of a, a team from the from the outset, um, particularly I suppose, caught my interest. And uh, yeah, I'm glad I did take the, the jump sort of four years ago. And Sarah, you joined from McCrane and Lavington. Um, um, yes, I hope there's not too many screams in the background at the moment. There's bath time happening next door, <laughs> just to warn you. Um, but um, I was at McCrane and Lavington prior to joining the Design and Feasibility team. And um, I basically, I'd been working on housing projects since leaving university. Um, and prior to that, I'd done my part one at Hampshire County Council Architects Department. So I'd always had a bit of an interest in architecture as a kind of public service. Um, but whilst that was a kind of school-based architects, I'd kind of, everything I'd done said subsequently had been to do with housing and housing was kind of really where my interests lay. Um, and so when this, I suppose I saw this, like, this opportunity I've advertised, I've really, been really interested in the work that Finney and Finn and then Lashley Chloe had been doing in the placemaking department. So I was kind of, I was aware of the forward thinking nature of Croydon as a council and the idea of being at something at, at its inception that was kind of delivering housing even if private housing, but with proceeds coming back to the public sector, I thought was a very kind of, was a really kind of appealing offer at that stage. Mm. Yeah, I think it was kind of, I think I've forgotten to a certain extent about how kind of, how much of a blank canvas it was. It's quite interesting, a bit of a retrospective and kind of, you know, you know, starting out with um, kind of an opportunity to almost start an architecture practice, but it's also, it's not necessarily a personal one. Mm. It's, you're doing for another organization but at the same time you've got to inject personality in terms of what what we were doing um, completely. i think so the social conscience was also a big factor as well sort of knowing that the money was going flowing back into the council i think that from you know is that being the um part of the foundations of the setup of the practice it was only you know it was only going to go one way in terms of its um you know, its social conscience was just going to grow with it as yeah. a local as also a local coin resident some time sort of lifelong coin residents that had a bit of a vested interest in the money going back to the council too yeah it's been quite there's been increasingly more coiden residents joining or kind of common ground and brick by brick as well it's quite an interesting kind of attractor for local people mm. um which is great um do you want to go through the scheme alex yeah certainly um so this is pump house um internally it was kind of been known as station road for some time so to Give me if I uh, spot between the names. Um, it's located on Station Road uh, in South Norwood, which is in the north of the borough of Croydon. Um, it's right next to Norwood Junction uh, Railway and Overground Station. It's sort of, sort of 100 metres from the station itself. Um, it's located within the South Norwood Conservation Area, which is, I suppose, as a conservation area, has got quite um, certainly along Station Road anyway, has got quite individual and spread up types of building, um, but generally sort of an underlying Victorian uh, brick um, aesthetic um, interspersed with, with different degrees of development. Um, so I started working on the project sort of fairly early doors, just pre-stage one um, in 2016. Um, and the site, as you can kind of see on the screen, is, is, a, is a corner site um, that has kind of been shaped over time by the, the highways that turn that corner, um, the corner on Station Road and, and Car Green Road is the more residential one that runs more north to south. Um, and it previously had a, uh, a leather working hall on it, um, which we kind of found through sort of historic archives that seem to have been demolished sometime in the mid 1950s. Um, and has laid dormant, um, or had laid dormant sort of ever since the, the 50s. Um, the large building on the left hand side of the plan, as you look at it, is currently an Audi supermarket. And I think that's kind of changed hands. It's been a cost cutter previously, and, but it's, it's, it's always been quite a large site. Um, and prior to that, there was a, a cinema on the site, which we kind of get to in some of the latter slides. Um, but on Station Road, I suppose it kind of runs east to west, and then the um, crossroads at the top of the screen is with the high street. And that high street um, condition does start to bleed down through Station Road. It's quite commercial in its in its frontages, um, and then to the south, it becomes more residential as you work towards. There's more open space by the railway lines. So it's, it's it, although it, it turns a corner between two roads, it also represents kind of interjunction between. Um, Sorry, I need to keep on moving the page. Sorry, Alex. Yeah, that's, <laughs> yeah. that's all right. Um, 
And then it's probably probably worth pointing out that you've got this um, element at the, sorry, another kind of brick by brick site is Belgrave and Grosvenor um, estate to the north, which is something that um, HTA are working on as well. So it's, it's quite, a, it's an area where the council has historically owned kind of quite a few plots. Mm. Um, is there anything else you wanted to, I cut you off midway, sorry. No, that's fine. I think we're probably ready for the next slide if we wanted to. I mean, I, I put this one in because I was talking about the proximity to the, the neighbours. Um, and we've got, whilst it's kind of a, a, quite an empty site in its first instance, there's, um, there was a number of windows and party wall conditions that we had to deal with as, with the site, which had just kind of lain empty for kind of 30 or 40 odd years. Um, so I mean, yeah, it's been hoarded in recent years as well. Kind of been noticeably quite empty, you know, as you walk past it as a pedestrian. Yeah, and it's quite a mixed, I guess this slide is quite useful because it's kind of, there's a mixed, there's a real mixed grain of the, um, of the buildings around it. This, this is kind of the conservation area extent really, which does include our site. Um, but you can kind of see the other side of the street is quite consistent in terms of its Victorian kind of frontages and our side has kind of been slightly obliterated through the kind of the, the 20th century um, and then there's a real difference in scale when you come to kind of the towers of Belgrave and Grosvenor as well so it's kind of it was a real opportunity to kind of try and repair the site or repair some of the street some of the damage um, to the street scene I'm back over to you. Yeah, yeah, I, yeah, I think it's a really good point. I think sort of seeing those two conditions together and it's quite obvious in the AXO, you know, from the height differences. Um, and so that's broadly what the footprint in our early sketches did. It was looking to, to wrap that corner in a quite a literal sense um, and follow the perimeter of the site to kind of maximise its extent, um, which was then quite simply extruded up. Um, and then towards sort of the latter sketches, it, the, the concept of sort of two interlocking forms um, that you know, present themselves on two different facades um, started to, started to. Sorry, it was zoomed on too quickly. It became, I suppose it became more, the concept became quite ingrained from that stage onwards sort of the idea of it having a commercial frontage addressing Station Road um, and then physically stepping down with a secondary frontage then, you know, presenting itself to, to Car Green Road that was more in keeping sort of the residential street. Um, and I suppose mm -hmm. the locking form ultimately meant that the you know, planner's initial advice was you know, a corner building of that nature should ought to have a setback. Um, I suppose it does have a setback of sorts, but not perhaps in the, uh, the obvious sense. Um, yeah, it allowed us to kind of have a more pure form and not have an, it also, I guess, kind of one of the, um, uh, one of the things we have to be quite mindful of is the finances of the projects. Um, so it's kind of, if we can avoid kind of doing any offset steel work or kind of things like that or any additional um kind of clumsy kind of transfers it just means that we can prioritize where kind of our money goes on the outside of the building as well um one thing we were quite keen to avoid or i was quite keen to avoid from the outset was there's this this square this site was once upon a time square with the leather working hall on it um and we had this nice kind of mm. track engineered curve that was kind of dominated the site but you know there's no there's no kind of features locally that have got a big curve on them and didn't really want to kind of create a, a curved facade that kind of looked in an angular way on the on the street um so it's quite important that there was kind of still a building that kind of faced um onto the street and gave kind of um, gave a bit of confidence back to that street scene um which was kind of this had been a big gappy tooth in it for a long time. Um, and so the idea of interlocking these two forms kind of allowed the square frontage that kind of gave that confidence to the street scene. And the curved building ends up being kind of a more humble kind of lower building that then hugs the corner. And so, yeah, so you've got the, the kind of, um, elevation kind of demonstration it kind of explains kind of what I was pointing out with the um, the, front, the frontages on the on the 
up to, on the north side of the street are kind of quite consistent and then this side was kind of far more broken down and the idea of actually putting a building back in that kind of sits right in the centre of the space was in the street was really important. Yeah, there are quite distinct clusters of, of, of groupings of buildings or pairs of buildings that exist along along the road. Um, you know, varying height, I suppose, but that corner site did show it present itself as an opportunity to have something that was, you know, perhaps a bit taller, a bit more confident that held that corner um, with a degree of certainty. Um, and that's an image of the uh, cinema I mentioned previously, sort of an Art Deco Odeon that had stood on the site of the current Audi building. Um, which was unfortunately demolished, but had had that elegance once upon a time and, and had that confidence um, that the sort of the, the road seemed to be missing. Um, so it was just trying to unify it, you know, together and to, yeah, to bring that composition back to the fore. Yeah, I think I was amazed when we found that photo. I was just like, how on earth has this street been missing that when it had that all along? Um, it's so sad that it's not there anymore. Um, is the kind of the supermarket building with the flats above it really doesn't give much back to the street scene. No, it just seems very endless. It's just so long along that high street. It just seems gone forever, sort of the repetitive bays. Um, yeah, so do you want to talk through these, Alex, or? Yeah, yeah. Um, so this is, I suppose, just a position through to so how the building form developed. Um, so this, yeah, these two interlocking forms um, sort of expressed as in the sketches, two different shades of form materiality, but essentially it's yeah, an interlocking composition that at this point then has a finger joint. So the, you know, yeah, the illusion of it being carved away almost having that solidity. Um, and that sort of started to show off the balconies that are quite obvious in, in the front of the design. Um, and then although you've got these two interlocking forms using sort of window proportions and their composition on the facades as a, um, uh, sorry, I've just frozen a bit as the unifying proportion. Um, yeah, I think we, it's kind of important together. to have it as a symmetrical facade um, that was kind of had that, that referenced the Odeon building as well. And the proportions of the windows try and reference the kind of proportions of the Victorian kind of building stock as well. Yeah, and then, and then the articulation of sort of the ground uh, floor condition um, being slightly separate. There's no flats that occur on the ground floor. It's a, it's a commercial frontage that fronts to Station Road. So it's having that larger floor to ceiling height, um, wider bays, um, and ultimately a large area of glazing. Um, and then the articulation of the top being ever so slightly different and sort of protruding beyond the darker form um, and elevating it to its highest point. Mm. And then this, so this kind of starts to build it out in more detail with kind of these um, kind of idea, kind of ca calibrated columns that kind of sit between each of the plastered floors. Kind of we played around for quite a long time to figure out what what was the style of architecture we wanted here. I and mean, at one point it looked quite Art Deco. Realised didn't really want a pastiche Art Deco building. And it's like, how do we create something that's genuinely a residential building for the 21st century um, that references that that kind of language so we kind of came up with this idea of this articulated kind of um, expression on the facade that kind of reference that's kind of got this geometric pattern on it and then through kind of alternating brickwork colors kind of create these kind of buffers that sit between them um, that worked reasonably well we had some fun down here <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I suppose that it articulates quite well the step back we needed at the, the rear. There was window windows on both uh, adjacent flank walls, um, so it had to do a bit of gymnastics at the back, although it was kind of staggered sequentially, um, which sort of gives rise to a, a roof terrace at the rear um, and, and a communal courtyard at ground floor as well. Um, and yeah. then there's a larger terrace that occurs on the curved building. Sarah, did you want to talk through the, the layouts? Yeah, so I can talk through the layouts um, quickly. So this is a kind of typical floor plan. Essentially, there's, there's the commercial unit at the ground floor, then there's three three typical floors, and then you just get the two the two units on the top floor that was the kind of white element of the interlocking forms. So the typical floor plan was is four units around a core. Um, it's kind of most of the most of the most of the um, outlook is orientated towards the street, so either station road or towards Cargreen Road. 
there are a couple of um, secondary windows to the back of the um, building and then you can see from looking at the kind of the south of um, this plan how the building really does step back quite considerably to kind of deal with the white to light issues that we had on the um, boundary wall of the um, supermarket site adjacent to the um, to the but to the to our site so this so this was kind of we started with a much larger block and kind of through the design process slowly carved away more and more of it to kind of achieve a um, amount of daylight um, into those existing windows mm, and i think in to a certain extent i mean it always ended up being quite a compromise not compromise quite a difficult site to try and get that many homes on but i think as a result of making it much thinner over here we've ended up this because north is kind of up in that direction up the page um this the the kind of homes have ended up being kind of more than you know, dual aspect by having kind of windows out the rear as well which ended up being kind of it's got all a little bit more thin down as we went along and these two homes get extended upwards so you don't get and then these two just drop off when you get to the top floor Um, and kind of as part of our remit as um, the design and feasibility team, I think initially, I need to quite go over the history, um, we worked on the kind of the interior specifications. So the kind of the interior specifications that were then rolled across the, um, all the sites that we like initially gone into contract with. So this was quite a kind of piece of work in its own right, but it's also been realised in Pump House. And we were quite keen for the kind of the fittings to have kind of to have a bit of character and a bit of kind of depth to them in a way that we often felt was kind of missing from a lot of modern developments so kind of having making sure we had timber engineered timber on the floors and likewise having timber handles to the kitchen kind of gave them a bit more, gave it a bit of warmth and the other thing in the kitchen design that we were quite interested in um, was to kind of was put to put some shelves um, in the high level so everything it wasn't just all um, high level units so that people could kind of characterize their spaces with them with a bit more a bit more freely than if everything was just um, hidden behind cupboards yeah and i think whilst it's this probably isn't kind of groundbreaking kind of interior design in terms of kind of high-end architecture i think what we were trying to create was kind of a good level of ordinary um that everything you touched is a really good quality material and there's character in it and it's not bland um and it's not your kind of standard developer fare um, and we've had kind of quite a lot of people saying, oh, I can feel your scheme, we'll just put laminate flooring in. Like everything that we've got is kind of a careful balance between, yes, we've got kind of parquet engineered timber flooring, but we're kind of, that's offset somewhere else by kind of, you know, having carpet in the bedroom or having a more simple kitchen, but we've prioritised having a style stone worktop and things like that. So. It, it's kind of been a complete balancing act all the way through and I think because we have got this spec through all of our developments it's allowed us to kind of develop relationships with each one of the suppliers so they kind of know exactly when a contractor rings up and kind of says I've got a brick by brick project what it is that they're going to be bringing and they'll give them a good price and all of that sort of stuff so it kind of it, 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 it works quite well um, and then these are the bathroom and bedroom. Yeah, so you can see in the bedroom shot how the kind of the carpets in the bedroom, the finished in the bedrooms is much bit more basic than the kind of the living space and the bathrooms. Those were the ones that we kind of focused on in terms of really getting the quality and the finishes. Um, like as the bathroom, we were quite keen to kind of have a slightly quirky um, vanity unit. So again, something that's not quite off the shelf. And I think this has actually been quite a complex thing to deliver on quite <laughs> projects, but. Um, yeah, we're redoing, we're redoing the, spec. <laughs> the, the current, uh, we're redoing the spec to kind of for the new pilot of sites that are coming forward. So we're going to be having a mark two of things that things that have worked well and things that kind of needed to be changed. So I think the bathroom is kind of one of the ones where we're changing it the most. It's just been quite difficult to deliver. Um, and then this just quickly looks at the, um, the plan of the ground floor, which kind of we went through a number of um, variations kind of through the planning process. Um, kind of the initial brief was that we were providing a commercial space on the ground floor. It then kind of became increasingly clear that Croydon Council wanted to use that as a new library space for Southport Norwood. And kind of, they had a very, they kind of a vague brief of what they wanted that was based on trying to get the maximum amount of accommodation into the ground floor of our site and our building, which is why there were some slightly strange things going on with the residential entrance, for example. They, um, it was kind of 
we kind of had to carve out as much space as possible to give over to the library as opposed to kind of have a much kind of have a, the generous residential entrance that we kind of started off with where you you have a straight wall coming in as opposed to this funny little dog leg that we we've ended up with um but i think the library the library space itself is pretty is pretty substantial and should be quite a good unit once it's once it's fitted out mm. and i think on looking at it on this plan i think we we're all heartbroken at the point where we knew we had to do this but actually in reality it's quite it's not it's actually quite a generous space in there and it then i think it works reasonably well little photo <laughs> this is it <laughs> we're on site so we haven't quite got back to site to take all of our finished internal photos yet um I'm kind of the, there's kind of step brickwork i'm leading you into the residential entrance which is a kind of trying to put uh, again putting a bit more detail into the brickwork and a kind of a slightly art decorish kind of feel to it so giving a bit more texture and character into the entrance um that seems to be working quite well yeah and i think this was the kind of it we've got this kind of elongated kind of herringbone language that runs all the way through the interiors and into the parquet flooring um and the idea that it's much louder and kind of dramatic and more like a victorian threshold kind of tiled um entrance into a home in the entrance hallways um and then it gets quieter as you go up into the internal spaces and then this is it starting to go up which was quite an interesting uh, period um i think procurement had always been a big risk for the small sites um i think you can kind of design them quite sensibly you can get some great architects involved um but then if you can't find the right contractors to build it then it's going to be very very difficult um so we divide well as brick by brick we devised a strategy for um tendering out the smaller sites um and break them down into packages of about 20 million pounds each and kind of tendered them to 12 different contractors on a single stage dmb um with the view that um there would be there were four packages within that within those 12 contractors and three contractors were priced for each and we would take uh, the, the winners and the three fastest losers um, through um, onto a framework. Um, so this was slightly behind that sequencing, um, but we ended up with one of the contractors, Neil Cott, who have done an absolutely brilliant job um, on site with this project. Um, but one of the things that we have, that have done as part of trying to kind of get working with the contractors was to leave a lot of the internals and structures and MEP for the contractors to um, design themselves. So there's still something that they could design. We locked down the externals um, in terms of brick detailing and uh, external landscaping to kind of about stage four, but left kind of the coordination to be done by the contractors, um, meaning that they could make efficiencies where it works for them, but, but not the cost of stuff that was important to us. Um, and so this interestingly shows this project going up as a steel frame. We thought it was going to be concrete, um, which presented some issues. Um, but generally it's been, it's worked quite well. Alex kind of did the kind of um, work on site through this. Um, and I mm -hmm. kind of we work just, I guess, before I hand over to Alex to talk through, the, the site work, I guess we work quite differently to how a standard architecture practice works because we're embedded within the same organisation as Brick. We stay as the executive, sorry, they stay as the client side architect um, through construction, but we do all the client side monitoring for every single project across our portfolio, um, which kind of allows us a bit of a glimpse into how everybody else is doing it. Um, and whilst that's kind of traditionally not what a lot of architecture practices would like to do because they want to be there with the contractors. I guess our client side responsibility kind of ends up being quite hand, hand in hand with the contractors anyway, because we're kind of the ones that are still there at the end. We don't have the, oh, your feed burnt, so we're not really interested in talking to you anymore. Um, we just want to get this handed over. So we end up being quite kind of close to a lot of the construction projects than we perhaps traditionally would have we'd been innovated over um so alex did the client side monitoring on this and did this part three on it more importantly yeah it was quite an interesting case study <laughs> <laughs> yeah. 
So, uh, sorry, um, yeah, we, we like, like Claire was saying, we do do client zone monitoring for all of our sites, but we had a you know a vested interest in this one, um, seeing our own designs kind of realised to the best they could be. Um, so when the contractor decided to switch from yeah concrete, as we had envisaged it, or at least had we drawn it up um, to steel, this is still early steel is going up. You can see the lift shaft going in. Um, there were kind of some coordination issues from the outset that kind of resulted in a few you know, lumps and bumps that we weren't necessarily expecting, with which we kind of worked with the contractor quite closely to try and design out as, as they were progressing works on site. So even from the very beginning, I thought we had quite a close working relationship um, with the contractor and yeah, in, in resolving anything that kind of reared its head mid construction. Um, uh, this yeah. is yeah, this is probably three months in to the build. Um, there wasn't yeah, there was no site demolition aside from sort of breaking ground. Um, there was nothing much on site to begin with, so it was relatively quite a quite a fast start. Apart from the uh, lengthy party wall negotiations and service diversions, but. <laughs> <laughs> And then, yeah, we've popped it up quite quickly. Do you want to talk through these? Because it kind of, the, the, I think the steel frame made it go up like pretty quickly. Yeah, I mean, the pictures are very self explanatory. When it kind of, the steel frame flew up, and then this is scaffolding and putting all the MetSec in. Um, and this was, yeah, still with our old brick by brick branding on the scaffolding. Um, but it, it kind of went up very quickly. And then from that point onwards, sort of, the site compound was, you know, Quite visible. There was no because we were building on the majority of the sites, so most of the footprint was taken up um, in terms of site storage uh, and facilities for keeping materials and bits. Was, that was where the library came into its own. So the ground floor became a place to store all the materials um, and sort of the compound for the site. Um, this is when the scaffolding came down a couple of months ago, um, and you can start to see where the brickwork sort of on the uh, on the columns. Does that look nice and crisp? Yeah, we kind of had an interesting moment because we wanted quite a soft red brick. Um, I think one of the reasons the, the building ended up staying like this for quite a long time whilst they fitted out the internals and then the brick kind of rocketed up in the final few months, really. You can kind of just mm. say, so, um, was it because we'd gone for quite a soft red brick, the tolerance on that ended up being quite a lot smaller. Um, and yeah, the white came in their uppermost tolerance, didn't they? And the red came in their lowermost tolerance. So actually, so when they were was, out on site, there was quite a noticeable difference that they had to account for in laying the brickwork that took a bit more time than they had anticipated. Yeah, but I think they ended up doing a really good job. Um, mm. and this is with the balconies all going in. Um, and then this is what it looks like today, which... Um, is really great to see um we've got um i think this uh, this image in particular kind of shows kind of how this kind of quite kind of confident white brick building sits in the middle of the street and this the red building kind of helps tie it into these um kind of victorian fronted properties to the south um and really does make a huge difference to how this how station road um feels as you come out of the station um and it's just kind of a close-up of one of the columns of just going back to that diagram i was talking about earlier with the calibrated corner details um the red brick kind of sits in the dark spots um and we've used the the red brick kind of tracks around kind of 20 mil retest in from the white brick front to kind of articulate the um articulate the kind of geometry of those forms um and then this is the front elevation. You'll kind of notice the cropping of the bottom where the library hasn't quite been finished. <laughs> um, and one thing we haven't quite got a picture of yet um, is this: we've got the stripy, we've got the stripy lift core to the back, which, when you view it from the rear, kind of has this quite nice layering effect when you see it from Car Green Road. And then this is the red building again. It, it follows the same design principles of having these kind of calibrated columns um but it's all done in a single brick and is much more simple in its execution um and then these are some of the schemes we're working on and so we've got fairfield homes which is at the top right hand corner we've just got planning for uh, which is our biggest scheme so far um which we're just working on stage three on that at the moment uh with micah doing the rest of the scheme um, Coombe Road 
there's another corner plot in the centre of Croydon, which is um, just going into contract now. Um, and then we've got Bramley Hill Estate, which is kind of a scheme for uh, 53 homes on an exist on a, this is our first estate scheme in Phil Estate in kind of just central Croydon. And this is a really lovely little scheme, um, Selston, in Selston Road in South Croydon, uh, which is on an old garage block to the rear of um, kind of a kind of um, housing development, which is about the same scale, but just behind us. So that's it. Thank you for listening. Any questions? Thanks so much, Chloe, um, Sarah and Alex. Um, if you have any questions, please um, pitch them in the chat. Um, I've got one from Lucilla. I'm going to unmute now. Um, yeah, there you go. Great. Uh, so thank you first uh, for the presentation. That's been very interesting. So I guess my question, um, I'm interesting because I'm a new starter actually for Croydon Council. So I'm trying to understand some uh, the relationship with Brick by Brick. And so could you specify better the relationship between like council funding and Brick by Brick's individual projects budget? I guess, I mean, do you kick off with the project uh, already knowing the disposable budget or the council is flexible accordingly to quality of each project? I don't know. So we're, we're kind of funded quite differently to a standard council project. So we, in our essence, are kind of a separate development company. We're a commercial business. Um, and we, and that kind of does, does a number of things, but it basically allows us, the, the council to kind of effectively make money um, out of the projects that we deliver. Um, so we buy, so there's a number of ways that the count that, that is done. We get, we buy the sites from the council. So they're not just sites that um, the council owns and then we have a budget to develop on. Um, and then the funding we can technically get from anywhere. Um, but we choose to get it from the council because the council can, um, so we, we borrow the money from the council at a commercial rate. Um, and the council makes money on lending us that money. Um, and so we have to, we have kind of a drawdown agreement with the council um, to say, we think we've got these sites we want to take forward. We think it's going to cost us this much. Um, and then we, we agree that each project is going to be worth that amount of money. And then we draw down that money as and when we need it. Um, and then we're now starting to pay back. And so this year is the first year that we're paying back um, some of those loans. So it works differently to kind of setting a budget. So we, we have to be responsible ourselves for knowing that the schemes are viable. So having a viable, a commercially viable scheme is a really part, a big part of conversations that are linked into the designs of the projects. We also need to make sure that we're kind of getting the most efficient or most value for our money. So I guess we're a weird architecture practice because we kind of know the inner workings of a development company um, and where that value best lies. Does that answer your question? Yeah, definitely. Thank you. Um, we've also got something, a question from Luke Tosa. I've just said I'm Luke. Hello. Hi, Chloe. Um, Hi, Luke. Hello. How are you? Hi. Um, <clears throat> a quick one. What do you think are the lessons from your uh, design guardian role in the first phase, both acting on your own projects and on others? Uh, how long have you got? <laughs> Two minutes. Um, uh, we... I think we've lost Chloe. Um, it's like we wouldn't have got to. I mean, You're back. I'm back. Um, I guess we wouldn't have got to where we are without being as ambitious as we were in the first instance. Um, so doing 50 small sites as one program was ambitious um, and there's really been some that we found have been incredibly problematic as we've gone through um, but that said we've developed you know there's 20 of them 20 um, projects that are kind of nearing completion or have completed now 
uh, which is an amazing thing for a development company that started four years ago. Um, lessons learned, uh, stay away from boundaries unless you absolutely need to. So we've got kind of a new rule, which is particularly on garage sites to the rear, stay at least a metre and a half away from um, boundaries. Um, we have learned um, a lot about kind of what we want as a client. I think, I think we've got much more savvy about what is by brick product, what works for us, what doesn't, um, what is where the problems are get, we're quite good at spotting problems in designs now um we have learned an awful lot from doing the internal specs so they're starting to we've made um some changes to that recently and i think the product's going to be better and it's, it's going to be much cheaper for us to deliver as well um uh loads and loads <laughs> Yeah, just keep on setting yourself targets, really. I think we're constantly just trying to kind of create new things to aim for. So we're also looking to try and do one planet living. Well, we are, have committed to doing one planet living on our projects moving forwards as well. So zero carbon on new projects. Just, you know, just keep making your own life as hard as possible and, and you'll do better than not trying. Be ambitious. Um Next up is um, Max, who I'm going to unmute now. Hello, hi, um, my name is Max Jubney. Um, I've been hugely impressed by seeing the progress and the quality of the architecture that Brick by Brick has made over the last four years. I mean, it's absolutely outstanding. And um, I just wondered, what are your ambitions um, for the next five years? So we see ourselves as a development company. We're based, well, we're based in Croydon. Our profits go to Croydon. We're a development company for Croydon, first and foremost. Um, but we're now starting to acquire sites that are not ones that the council owns. Um, we are a development company that wants to de deliver 500 new homes a year. Um, and that's kind of what we're setting ourselves up to be able to do. Um, and if they are on... Croydon own sites we're also doing that um, and so we're looking at new opportunities across the country as well as kind of local to London um, also kind of looking to kind of sell our development expertise on small sites in particular and also looking to work, looking to deliver new ways of um, new homes so looking for opportunities with community groups and facilitating them and community-led housing as well so as much as you know we've, we want to build on the expertise we want to start using the expertise that we've learned over the last four years to really kind of help housing delivery across as many places as we possibly can we know Croydon and South London particularly well so it makes sense for us to be focusing in that area no that's great um, I'm, and um, I mean do you, because it seems like you've done it relatively um, easily compared to what some other councils, you know, have struggled to do. Um, mm. And um, I'm just interested, is that because Croydon were very, very sort of progressive to work with? Do you think it's a model that can be rolled out across, you know, other boroughs and that actually, you know, we could see much more, you know, small sites as well as larger sites with high quality architecture? You know, I think it's already I think it's already happening in other local authorities that like most people that I speak to particularly in London and even out of London as well are you know nearly every nearly every council has got a development company um some of them don't aren't particularly are more dormant some of them are very active um you've got kind of the likes of Red Door Ventures and Be First who are doing kind of similar well be first is doing probably much more work than we are um i think we've been successful and for a large part because we were ambitious um and i was trying to make the point at the beginning of the uh, presentation about kind of the politics in particular in croydon and um things aligning shall we say in terms of corporate will and need because they needed to make money and um kind of the Kind of local and, and the politics wanting to actually be progressive and so if you have all of those things together it really makes things happen and i think other boroughs can struggle because sometimes those things work against each other 
Um, I think I have to take the last question um, from Jesse Honza. I'm going to unmute now. Okay. So, hi, thank you very much for the talk. Uh, I wanted to ask about um, the challenges of dealing with small sites and infill sites, and um, specifically if your relationship with the council gives you any sort of advantage to dealing with uh, sites that maybe other developers, the type of sites that other developers wouldn't be able to, if you have any insights to give about that. Um, I guess we, uh, compared with ordinary developers, we obviously know or have a way of finding out where all the small sites are. So one thing we did as Common Ground and Alex and Sarah did a whole work of people work on that was mapping every single potential site that Croydon Council could own or does own that we could look at developing. And that was a massive kind of relationship win, I guess, with the council. Um, but from all other aspects, it's it's kind of i don't think it's certainly in planning it's no different we um don't get any special kind of measures um we don't want to we want to be treated the same as everybody else um so we work through a planning consultant and um have regular pre-apps um with the planners um and so we don't get we obviously kind of know croydon quite well so we've got a working relationship with them which perhaps is quite different from if you're a smaller developer and kind of working on different sites in different parts of the country or London, um, that you're kind of potentially kind of meeting a different planner every time that like we do have that relationship, I guess, and stewardship of the borough. Um, and yeah, we're kind of, yeah, I don't think we get any special treatment. 